really beautiful. I am still learning a lot about that position. And um, I have just noticed the collaboration and um, putting forth that demonship is kind of part of this job. And uh, yeah, I want to let people know that I'm open to ideas and collaboration and projects and all that kind of thing. So uh, our four tenants is education, waste reduction, recycling reduction, um, and uh, beautification. So if there's anything that kind of falls into those parameters, I'm more than happy to try and collab with anybody out there. And, um, yeah, so I just uh, want to introduce myself and let people know that I'm available in the community. Awesome. Yeah, That's all. yeah it's good to meet you. Certainly, um, in the past, working with Sarah Heyer through Keep Garden of Beautiful um, has been very helpful and the projects that, that Keep Cardinal Beautiful has worked on is, you know, they're great. So um, good to meet you. I'm, Jane Kobe. I'm with Carbondale Community, I'm with the Shawnee Group of the Sierra Club and then also um, the Sustainability Commission of Carbondale. Sarah's on that. So she and yes. I worked together a bit on that. Yeah. Right on. Yeah. Everybody seems to have the a tie-in with Sarah. She's been at her job for almost 10 years, so there's like some big shoes to fill there. And uh, well, we wanted, yeah, wanted but... to do that justice. <laughs> <laughs> okay, do we want to go around and, and, and have everybody do a little intro or do we all know each other? Is Anne the only new one? Well, it'd be nice for Anne to meet. Uh, yeah, that's true. She probably <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> so my name's George Ann Hartzog. I uh, work with the Peace Coalition of Southern Illinois mostly, and um, uh, you know, let Jane talk me into doing things occasionally. And, uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> and Nick, of course, um, uh, appreciate seeing what Nick is doing. So uh, we've been around since uh, 1983. Uh, we generally hold. Uh, monthly used to be weekly vigils on the town square there on different topics related to peace or the environment or justice issues and I think uh, we don't really have a topic but I think we'll with the opening up of the state we'll resume that with like six feet between us on um, the first Saturday in June so huh. we'll into one on the town square and um, I had been working some with the Poor People's Campaign, so I was just going to share some information about some of their uh, upcoming events, which are pretty, at this point, all online. Um, and just uh, encouraging people to uh, sh share the information. Very good. So, Jane, did you you gave your introduction well pretty well yeah um i mean shawnee group and uh community solar working group for quite some time trying to get community solar in the area we haven't given up on that so uh once uh cj gets passed the clean energy jobs act uh hopefully that will pass we'll see how the things go of course uh with covid and and the focus um but maybe in the fall so that would bring back the possibility of pursuing community solar. Um, but, but yeah, no, I think I've probably done justice to that for now. Thanks. <clears throat> okay. Nick, you wanna introduce yourself real quick? Yeah, hi. Um, uh, I'm Nick Smoligo and uh, I'm working, I'm one of the organizers with the Carbondale Spring. And uh, I've been working for the last couple months on the food autonomy initiative of the Carbondale Spring. And I have like small presentation to give you all or photos, but I can wait if we're just kind of going around uh, for that. Um, but yeah, thanks for, it's nice to see you all. Um, yeah. 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 <clears throat> we'll just let, see if Or and Bo wanna say hello. Or you wanna say hello? Uh, sure, I'm just getting off work and going over to the Hump Day Farmer's Market. So. Ah, great. I was there, just there. Bought a ruella and a um, marmalade, um, jar of marmalade. <laughs> great. 
I'm in my new van. Yeah, I was going to say that's quite an imposing steering wheel you've got there. <laughs> Angle. Hey, Bo, you want to say hi? Hey, everybody. Uh, Bo Henson, uh, also organizer with uh, Carmel Spring, amongst many other projects. It's uh, good to see everybody. Yeah, you too. All right, yeah, Nick, if you want to go ahead. You were next on the, well, you were after Car uh, Carbondale Park District and um, Kathy couldn't be here, so you're up next. <clears throat> well, I'm gonna share my screen and um, this is basically a, um, a, just a slightly updated version of the presentation I gave two months ago when we did this. And I'm just gonna skip through some of the previous like uh, kind of framing stuff. But just so that everybody knows, um, we've been, let me see, how do I do this? Uh, nope, I just want to expand you. Let's see. All right, well, whatever. Um, so just for background, I think everybody's familiar. About a year ago, we started the Carbondale Spring. This began with an analysis of the city budget in which we argued that the city was overspending on police, that we have doubled the number of police uh, compared to the national average. And we proposed right-sizing the police and redirecting that, those funds toward uh, a number of transformative projects, one of which, and what I'm gonna be talking about today, is the uh, food autonomy. Um, and uh, what we generally mean, well, what, what our vision is, is that um, the city would actually fund to construct a food system within the town, actually paying people to grow a food safety net, um, which made sense to a lot of us a year ago uh, because of the unsustainability of the food system, because of the lack of access to healthy food or barriers imposed by the cost of that to people who need it most. And now I think it makes even more sense to a lot of people given the disruptions that we've seen in the food supply chains, the overburdens on food pantries, and the lack of access to money that a lot of people who've lost their jobs have and for whatever reason couldn't get that really generous unemployment money, which I've been milking. I should, can, can <laughs> or which I've been benefiting from, I should say. Um, so uh, what uh, we've done, or what, what's gone on the last couple months is uh, we received a really great grant from a local Carbondale supporter who, um, let me just, oh yeah, this is what I need. There we go. And uh, Peter Gregory is a Carbondale philanthropist who uh, basically agreed with us that in the, wake, or in, the, in the context of the pandemic, it was a good idea to uh, start building this idea of food autonomy. And so he gave us a $23,000 grant to really kickstart some of our ideas. And um, the aim of this grant is to fund uh, both to increase the food production within town and to be able to pay people to actually do it. And um, the food production that we focused on at this point is uh, gardens growing vegetables and also uh, building chicken food for people uh, in their backyards. So I'm just gonna give you a little progress report on this. This is a, a food force that uh, was created with the help of Libre Unschool and the Sierra Club grant um, two, two years ago is when it was planted. That's actually, that's doing really well. This, this uh, uh, photo is a little old, uh, like a couple months old, but all, all of the trees in here, which are fruit and nut and medicinal bearing trees are gonna be, are, are doing really well. And within the next few years, they should be producing a lot for us. Um, this was a, a project where we were giving out another round of uh, uh, fruit and nut bearing trees to people within the context of social distancing, but we gave out about a thousand uh, fruit and nut bearing trees to people uh, all over the region. Um, this was uh, our little backyard nursery, which has since been expanded even, um, and we've been producing uh, starts for the gardens uh, all over, but we formed a coalition of three gardens. This is the Washington Street Garden This is just the other day, which is doing great. Um, you see in the foreground is vegetables, and then in the background is the medicinal portion of the garden. And this is uh, the fifth year of this garden, um, which uh, was part of this coalition uh, for the, the Food Autonomy Project. 
Um, this was when we were dumping compost off at the Red Hen Garden, which is uh, the second uh, partner in, the co er, in our coalition here, uh, with which we're, the Red Hen Garden, of course, is run by Women for Change, and, um, but we're, we're collaborating with them. This was an accident with the compost pile. This is the before, early in the season. Um, I wish I had a last year photo of, of, of the Red Hen Garden. It was significantly smaller, and so the grant money allowed us to purchase the lumber and the compost to really expand this garden. This is the after um, what the Red Hen Garden looks like this morning. Um, and as you can see, the folks there have just done a tremendous amount of work. There's a whole lot growing. And, I, um, and just to give you a sense of how this grant is functioning, or one way that this grant is functioning, um, today I was walking down there to take this picture, and I ran into uh, Rowan and Kimani. And they were like, hey, do you have any work in the gardens that needs to be done? And I was like, yeah, come on down. And we spent a half hour harvesting um, greens. I paid them $5 for a half hour's work you know, so because it's where the rate is $10 an hour. And then we handed those greens out to people on our walk back home. And it's just like, you know, that there, there's, there's other modes that it operates in, which are more formal uh, with people who are kind of coming regularly and being paid. But it also allows us to just like offer work to folks who, you know, need to make a couple bucks. And that helps us because we get the food out of the garden and we get food into people's you know, hands free of charge. This is a uh, Valerie and a whole number of people that have been working at the Attics Community Farm. This is just south of the mosque. Um, so this is the before picture, and now this is the after picture. So this this was about a month ago, or a month and a half ago that this picture was taken, and now this is uh, last week. Um, you see, I got the irrigation system installed. That's another thing that this grant helped with. And so we have drip lines running down each of these beds. Uh, we also got straw, uh, which we purchased from someone down in Dongola. And there's a deer fence in. Um, this is the second quadrant of the, uh, the Addicts Community Farm, where you see there's a lot of uh, turnips and potatoes growing. And it's just been really, really beautiful. Um, this, this plot of land is owned by Addicts Community Services, who's working with us on this grant as well. And they... Um, you know, the, it's, it's been used as a garden space uh, off and on for 10 years, but this is really the first year that I think it's kind of starting to realize its full potential and it's made possible by these resources that we got. Um, so uh, here on the left is Demetria, who's one of the paid gardeners working in uh, the garden. And then on the right is Sherry, who's a neighbor. And Demetria and I had just uh, harvested food walked door to door, handed out stuff, and we met Sherry, and she's like, I, I love to garden, let me see it. And so we took her down, and then she says she wants to come by and volunteer, and so it's, it's really, really nice. Um, this is Rose, one of the neighbors, who let me take a picture of her while we were handing her <laughs> bag of greens. Um, and then this is the fourth uh, project. This is a Mahaji who uh, is setting up a small teaching garden um, on the, j just behind Mahaji is the food forest there. And so this garden, which maybe doesn't look as spectacular, but this was all planted by the kids that live around this uh, neighborhood. So we brought starts there and kind of talked to them about how to plant and they planted them and put the straw down themselves. And so that's just really exciting. And uh, you see behind it, uh, Mahaji's could sculpting some more beds there so that that can expand. Um, so it's been really, really exciting. I, this is just, I get to pay people, which is really exciting for this because uh, a lot of people put a lot of time and work into the gardens and it's really nice to be able to, you know, compensate them for labor on this stuff. Um, and then the other side of the grant, as I mentioned, is the chicken coops. This is uh, the, the design I, it's been nice to work with uh, Jessica Alley, who's a, uh, an actual trained architect. So she designed this chicken coop. Um, this is the kind of at end of the very first day of constructing the prototype of it. And then this is after. So I'm on the phone here. 
left is the first prototype chicken coop. Oh, that's on the right great. is the half, or yeah, it looks really nice, right? Um, <laughs> yes. and it's one at uh, Jessica Ali's house. And the difference here, it's taken us a long time just to get this right, because what we want to do for the remaining 10 chicken coops is to mass produce them. So we're going to get to use Little River Research's uh, manufacturing facility. And so we've really gone slow with these to make sure that we have all of the measurements exactly right so that we can cut, do all the met cuts for 10 coops at a time. And then we'll be able to assemble them in about two days um, at, at the remaining people's houses. Uh, so it's pretty cool. And then here are the chicks that uh, I picked up last week from Lebanon, Missouri. And so they're staying with our friends uh, south of town, uh, Chris and Adrian, who are who have raised lots of chicks. And so they're uh, gonna get taken care of for the first uh, four or five weeks while we're constructing the rest of the coops for them. Oh. Yeah. And so there are ways I, you can- I have a question. Yeah, sure. Um, you do know that the city has a permit required for chicken coops. I do know that, yep. Okay. Um, we talked in our last sustainability meeting about pushing back um, because the original thing we wrote said once you hit 25 permits, it was supposed to go back to the city and they were supposed to reassess about getting more permits. And as far as I know, haven't hit 25 permits yet. Yeah. So. Yeah, yeah. So what we're doing, and uh, it's kind of been slow going, but we'll, we'll be constructing just a list of all of these resources and um, giving those to the folks that are getting the coops where they can apply for the permits on their own. But, um, you know, also there, there are some people who are going to just be constructing them without the permits and um, kind of taking our chances there. Uh, and, you know, it'd be nice if the city raised that permit requirement or lifted it. Um, yeah. Well, we discuss it. We did discuss it at the uh, Sustainability Commission, and you seem to be saying or, and I think Lauren Polly agreed that yeah. that it was somewhat arbitrary that 20 or whatever it was is chosen, and that it wouldn't probably be not much of a fuss would be raised um, to increase it. Their, the procedure may take a little while. That's what I don't understand. Is I, I don't know. We haven't investigated how long that would take. But. Yeah. Well, um, well, our original proposal to the city was, you know, they, they wanted a limitation. So we wrote that said, once we hit 25, it goes back to the city council. And then there has to be a, you know, a public comment if anybody's, right. If there's right. any complaints. And sure, we, we've sure. never hit the 25, so... Yeah, and it's possible that we'll remain under 25 with this. Um, and I, but I think at least my orientation going toward this is that this, this actually is um, a necessary measure for some people, you know, like usually actually, you know, getting chicken coops is a luxury because the cost of building a coop and maintaining them, uh, you know, doesn't end up really making that much of a difference. But because we are actually subsidizing the cost of the, the creation of the coop, this is actually going to be economical for a lot of people uh, in a time that's very challenging and in a time which, you know, not just in the, the, the immediate moment, but in the uh, months and years ahead in which it is possible that we're headed for an economic depression, that we really actually just need to be uh, uh, planning to collectively provide calories for people uh, to plan for the worst. And, you know, it would be great if the, the city ordinance adapted to that necessity, but the necessity wins out in my opinion. Well, I don't think it needs to be either one or the other. That's my view. I mean, I think we can manage it. It'd be good to find out how many exist, how many you think are coming and get a, get a start on making it happen. Yeah. So, yeah. Cool. Well, um, yeah, and so, and, and it's also the kind of thing that we'd like to kind of continue doing. And um, if we get more donations and another round of grants, then we'll continue to uh, add more chickens throughout. And, and I should say that the condition of the chicken coops is one, that the chickens are well cared for, 
we, mm -hmm. we are building the coops in accordance with the, the rather stringent demands of the city ordinance, which make a lot of sense for, um, for, for certain uses of chickens. And, um, and then the, the, the major condition is that the, the surplus eggs are shared among neighbors. Um, so we're not, um, we're asking people not to sell the eggs, that the eggs are to be given to, to, uh, among neighbors. Well, I would just hate to piss off the city because it took us almost two years to get the existing ordinance in place. <laughs> just like, just like ridiculous. Yeah. Um, well, I, I mean, I guess thinking about the city and as just a final thought here, um, you know, right now the government, uh, federal government is spending and state government is spending a lot of money um, to prevent an economic collapse. Um, but what's very likely coming is uh, massive austerity measures and massive cuts, um, even at, especially at the municipal level, because it seems unlikely that um, cities will get uh, bailouts for the lost tax revenue from this whole uh, pandemic. And um, the normal course of events for how those kinds of uh, austerity measures comes is that, is that they cut from the kinds of things that most of us like and think are necessary. Um, they cut from social services, they cut from things like funding nonprofits and all the rest of it. And um, they do that and, and maintain their, and, and even sometimes build up and strengthen uh, the carceral apparatus and the policing systems. Um, and this is a, a incredibly dangerous uh, situation in that, in that regard. Um, I should say, uh, for folks that don't know, just as a kind of background, um, that one of the things that had happened in Ferguson in the years before uh, the uprising there in 2014 was that um, the city had lost massive amounts of tax revenue after the housing crisis and this and they had a large police department and the police department was instructed to start generating revenue and so um, by the time Mike Brown was murdered in 2014 actually there was an average of three warrants per household within uh, the city of Ferguson and so um, basically what, what I'm saying is we're in a context where we have a city that is already heavily overinvested in policing and uh, they're still contractually obliged to get a, a pay raise this year, despite the shortfall of, uh, of municipal tax revenue and that this actually creates a very dangerous situation. And so um, if we think if we really want to start taking our city in a, in a different direction, one that's ecologically sustainable, one that's foregrounding compassion, and one that isn't, um, uh, yeah, uh, held together by by force, um, then we really have to publicly articulate the need to transform the priorities of this town from one that is highly invested in police into one that is building the kind of world that we actually need to live in. Um, and so what we're creating with the Food Autonomy Project, I hope, will give us, you know, some way to point in that direction that we want to go. That's all. Thank you. Sorry for taking up so much time. And just one last thing, Nick. If you could just, if you could just uh, project how many you know will be built, and then, you know, what would be good to add on, just so that we, you know, because yeah. it can be a long time between when people talk, even if they want to talk soon. So letting us know so that we can get that that moving just that piece of it it's sure. not going to solve all the problems but yeah, yeah. we're going to be building 12 chicken coops 12 okay so that'd be added on to whatever exists already and then maybe give some cushion beyond that yeah yeah okay okay on a different note uh i was talking a little bit this about the meeting i had this morning about local community investment and funding strategies um and the speakers we had there in the discussion panel i think there's gonna be a lot of useful information we can get out of that, but I think we should start to bring in people with expertise in that area. Does anybody here on this meeting know of anyone that we should try to call into these meetings that has some sort of finance or banking or some sort of expertise like that? Bowie? Because I think what you're saying is absolutely right. I think we need to be realistic about the fact that uh, the funds are not going to come out of yeah. 
the air or something like that. We need to plan for this and um, think ahead. Yeah. And I think there's a lot of options. I think there's a lot of people around here that are able and willing to help with stuff like this. So we just have to educate ourselves on what is possible and start to start to do some of this stuff because there's there's a lot of stuff out there that we could be doing that we're not, I think. One of the things that I know that we've talked about a lot uh, and Bo and I've talked about a lot is that just like the, the framework for, you know, economic development for towns of this size is just fundamentally broken. Um, that that there's there's a script a model for how you develop that just literally doesn't work and and certainly doesn't work in a way that's just for everybody. And so I'm sure that there are people that have like radically different visions of that. But I also think there's a lot of work to do just like inventing it. Um, and I, well, I, I would certainly be interested in learning from the people that that have different uh, you know detailed knowledge about that. Yeah, I'll, do, I'll be sure and send out um, the videos once I get them uploaded um, from the event today. Cause I mean, there's just some really good ideas there. Um, stuff I had never thought of and stuff that we can do. So um, yeah, sounds good. And then hopefully we can start to make that kind of a more focused effort. Cause I think it's, it's an important one. Anything else anyone uh, I got any questions for Nick or anything? All right, I think next on our agenda was CJA. Jane, do you wanna say anything about that? Oh, I didn't know that. I mean, I, I said it at first, but um, <laughs> I, I thought I emailed back that some things are on hold, but I can give you a, a short update. Um, basically, um, the short, there was a short three day, I think it was uh, legislative, um, uh, session, if you can call it that, um, where it seemed like they were going to uh, work mainly on the budget issues. Part of the question was whether or not there would be some action that some some budget um, that could be devoted to some of the components of CJA. Um, I have not heard a report back yet to what actually happened, but um, there's still uncertainty about the part of the way I heard that the the session, CJA session was um, part of the purpose was to see, first of all, there were things that needed to get done because of the budget. There's also the sense of, can it work to hold another one of these sessions in June? Um, but I think most of the thought, right, the majority of people now are thinking that it, for sure a comprehensive bill wouldn't pass before the fall. And so the, on energy, um, um, Clean Energy Jobs Act, maybe some of you don't know what that is. I, I don't know if you know, Anne. Um, basically, it's the second round of funding for clean energy jobs, for helping with just transition money for coal communities where you've had uh, coal plants, power plants, just go bankrupt, uh, pull out because it was no longer profitable. And so um, as a consequence, one of the consequences anyway, is that you have um, massive drop in property taxes for because you can get a lot of property taxes from from power plants and so CJA this this uh, Clean Energy Jobs Act was really aiming at making life more predictable for those small towns both that have already been um, impacted it was uh, retroactive it's supposed to be around 10 years I believe so some of the plants that had already closed, you'd have some compensation and some training that the coal plants themselves or the, the companies would have to help pay for. Uh, one thing that I've discovered is that uh, through looking into this, is that Illinois is one of only three states of the 25 coal plants. Um, I mentioned this yesterday when I was talking about, about um, some, of the, some of the issues to why we need uh, solar. Um, only three of the 25 coal states that don't have a coal severance tax. So this would be kind of, CJ would be partly wanting to fill that gap in addition to creating, you know, a lot of opportunities for clean jobs, training, um, and of course, um, renewable energy. So the COVID-19 hit 
at the wrong time for a lot of things, <laughs> but uh, certainly hit at the wrong time for for Sija to pass. It was seemed like it was kind of on the verge of that. So, I think there are there are some working groups that um, are determined not to uh, give up on Sija, and so uh, and finding the balancing act of you know how you help unions as well as you know. Uh, solar companies that need funding for uh, continuing to have, uh, you know, Illinois credits for building solar. So there's a lot of pieces of the puzzle that that um, are needed and needed now. And so part of the deliberation is what do you forward first without breaking the leverage you have to for to pass the bill later, uh, so to speak. I could talk more about the 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 federal um, energy regulatory commission FERC that is a piece of the puzzle that is still very much weighing on people where there was a push to get um, people to send in uh, send emails to their legislators because um, FERC had this regulatory agency that's federal that Trump was wanting to push to have the rates for that um for the capacity market power plants be raised so that coal companies could keep going and get more pay because of the rates were being raised um and so illinois wants to opt out of that but the deadline for opting out of that and creating their own capacity market with lower rates having supporting alternative energy the due date for opting out is june 1st so that's still being so you you're welcome to write your your legislators for what it's worth ours don't listen a whole lot about things that go against coal but uh it can certainly be worthwhile to be aware of that deadline and that's one of the things that we're trying to get an extension that's one of the things um so if someone has questions i um i hadn't really prepared to talk about it but it but it certainly is key to a lot of what we're talking about um and you know there's a lot of local work including you know some of the renewable energy cooperative fund i get that name wrong all the time bo and um but um you know wanting to create a cooperative fund for uh solar workers here we really kind of do need the um, support of the renewable energy credits that are, are currently available through the first bill that passed. Thanks, so, Sam. partly staying tuned will be is maybe the, the bottom line here. <laughs> um, is there anything we could send out to people? You, I mean, I think I already signed the thing about FERC. Should we try that again, maybe one more round? Well, FERC, FERC, and then, um, yeah, the, the extension, that's big. Um, I'll look and see because I know there was one other thing that the, f the fair tax is another um, another thing that uh, would help Illinois economy to have be sure that uh, the legislator sticks with going for the fair tax so that people who are, have more money have to pay more of their fair share. Um, that's another thing that uh, environmental groups, in addition to others, are working for. But I'll, I'll let you know, Amy, that would be good to post if I can find find something else that that is besides the FERC. Okay, thank you. And I didn't mean to put you on the spot there, but you did. No, 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 that, no, that's fine. I didn't read the agenda, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it wasn't very formal, <laughs> the agenda. So any other, anyone want to ask Jane anything? Hi, Sarah, I see you joined us, Sarah here. Um, next on our agenda was, Hi. Hi. Oh, okay, four. Go ahead. My, my favorite part of the CJA is the is all the stuff about job retraining. Oh yeah. So yep. We're we're the the last one had some stuff with job retraining. This yep. new one has a lot <clears throat> more and focused on downstate more. So. Yes, indeed. And one thing that I didn't mention that that goes along with what you're saying is there were 14 job hubs. Uh, that were part of the bill and that came out of these listen lead share conversations that happened during 2019 um, 
and partly in 2018 to find out what was missing from that first bill that you wanted. And one of them was job hubs, like you're saying, or, and the first one was more just having agencies competing with each other. And here it would be hubs that combine training and, and actually helping people get jobs after they were trained, which is one of the big gaps. Right. I mean, we, we're, we're supposed to be doing right now a six week, um, yeah returning citizen training the problem is is there was no money in it for you know everybody was supposed to come to a central location and none right. of the people have good computers and so yeah. in the in the fall program they're going to get it so that everybody has not a good computer but a good cell phone that they could like oh, come good. on my cell phone good good so That's that people great. could be going to school mm. so right. You know, I've got 34 students in my class, so. And one of the hubs uh, was to be Carbondale slash, and will be hopefully still, the Carbondale slash uh, Johnny Logan, um, where a lot of the training that you do and um, happens. And so it, it would benefit us, our economy locally. Yeah, we just got a DOE grant to build a uh, training facility at Johnny Logan. Um, Oh yeah, so, really. I was just yeah, Tim, on, Tim Gibson on. talked about that. Um, he just retired, so yeah, I know, I know. But we we designed it all and put it all in place and got the grant so that um, what do you call it? anyway? He can retire with uh, gusto. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> yeah, sounds awesome. I mean, we're literally literally building a whole building for a solar training facility yeah. in the back of Johnny Logan. So. Yeah, no, he mentioned that. So they would have experience um, through doing building there um, as part of that site, as I understand it. That's gonna be like one of those jobs that like, is always gonna be in demand, I think. You know, like nurses, like, you know, I think that's such a great opportunity for this region. Well, 357 students I've trained over the last 10 years. <laughs> Only two of them work in Southern Illinois. Uh -huh. So it's, it is a new job. It's a new industry here, so. Yep, lots of growth potential for jobs, right? Very true. <laughs> yeah, we just lost one of my union guys. He got a job with a, a bigger solar company, so, because he had extensive solar experience now. Yep, that's what happens when you train people well. Yeah. <laughs> they, they leave you. <laughs> okay, any more questions for Jane? If not, we'll go ahead and move on to Georgianne, the Southern Illinois Poor People's Campaign. You ready to share your screen, Georgianne? Well, let me see if I can do this again. Nick, your front porch looks nice, cozy. <laughs> George Ann, my mom is one of the biggest advocates for this Poor People's Campaign. She's been Gosh, she saying, I'm gonna sponsor two people. And I was like, me and well, her are gonna sponsor two people somehow. Since it's, it's all, <laughs> Not anymore. All, but. Uh, yeah, so I just wanted to remind people, um, and I, gosh, I feel like it really uh, ties into the things Nick was talking about here on our local level and you know these uh, uh, folks are working at the national level but uh, and in each state and and uh, working to um, raise up the voices of uh, poor people low wealth people uh, people who've been adversely in fact impacted by COVID and by everything else that's going on um, their website at the poor people's campaign.org has a lot of information, uh, some pretty deep analysis and proposals. You, you might think that uh, the Bernie bros wrote it all, um, but uh, very comprehensive proposals for uh, what our uh, policies and sort of budget could be um, to make uh, our country a little bit more equitable. Um, and I would just like to mention that this evening, 
the Illinois Poor People's Campaign is having, I believe it's the third of their biweekly calls. Uh, they're going to have a speaker uh, this evening, um, uh, Carlos Rodriguez, who works with uh, adults and youth, um, the criminal justice system, immigration, uh, restorative justice, uh, and he's going to be talking about the Poor People's Campaign, stay in place, stay alive, organize, don't believe the lies. Uh, they do have some actual action um, uh, things that you can take, and it's very possible most of you are getting this sort of information if you ever signed up for the Poor People's Campaign or you are on the Peace Coalition email list because I keep sending this stuff out. Um, so that's this evening at 8 p.m. And uh, I, I also noticed from an, an email they sent out, um, so they're having, uh, I guess, maybe the last of their digital mass meetings tomorrow night. It would be at um, 7.30 Central Time. Uh, and, uh, you know, they one of the things that they've done is reach out to people impacted by what's going on and and have testifiers talking about their personal experiences which is always uh, pretty interesting um and i i do know that uh, reverend barber and reverend uh, theo harris have been interviewed on several news programs there's a nice interview on democracy now with uh, um, reverend barber and um uh on Democracy Now!, uh, the ABC has interviewed them. And then this coming Sunday evening, uh, there's going to be a special sort of roundtable thing on MSNBC. And that looks like that would be 8 p.m. Central Time, uh, if anybody tunes into to that uh, channel, that, that uh, network. Um, and, you know, I mean, he, he's always an inspiring speaker to listen to. Yeah. Uh, and of course, the the big deal really pushing for people to sign up. I mean, they'd like to have the largest digital um, meeting, mass meeting, social media meeting on June 20th. And um, there are links on the uh, website to uh, register for that meeting. And um, uh, they are doing phone banking if anybody, you know, was interested in that. Uh, but they're really trying to reach out to the 100,000 or so people who have expressed interest in the Poor People's Campaign in the last couple of years. Of course, we know that Martin Luther King helped inspire, helped start the first Poor People's Campaign in 1968, and, and that might have been one of the things that made it imperative to get rid of him. He was assassinated just before that campaign was initiated. Uh, this new version was initiated at, on the 50th anniversary back in, in, in uh, 2018. So I, I don't think I need to say anything else. Um, just to raise that up for you. That all sounds great. Um, yeah. Georgian, do you know if um, like the, the meeting tonight, is that going to be videotaped? Uh, I do believe I usually do tape them. They're Zoom okay. meetings, and um, if uh, I have the Illinois site there, do you want me to paste that into the chat? <laughs> well, can you just send me that document, and I'll just put it up. Uh -huh. uh, okay. If you want, I can put it up on the Facebook page and stuff, and on our. Okay. Because I know I posted something that you had sent me on the right. Love for Earth, right. but I can't remember if I had this. Right. And it might not hurt to paste that link into the chat too. Mm -hmm. Okay. I will do that. Yeah, if you just send me that that document. And you know what? These people have some brilliant media folks. Like I don't even know how to do Twitter or nothing. I don't belong to Facebook. Uh, <clears throat> but um, these people have a very sophisticated digital toolkit available for anybody who wants to help uh, spread around the information about what's going on. So, all right. So I'm going to take this down, and then I'll paste that Illinois site into the into the um, chat. Okay. Thanks. Any questions? Yeah, I think I, I'm on the agenda next for the Climate Economy Action Network. I'll just talk about that real quick. Um, 
I mean, the main things I'm going to say are that the, um, the events I've been having in the Metro East, I think, uh, I'll make sure that everybody's got the links for all those, those presentations and stuff, because I think there's a lot of good information in there for our community as well. And the Climate Economy Action Network, I'm trying to, to figure out how to get people to take actions. Because like a lot of, for a lot of people, this is such a big, complicated problem. They don't know what to do. They don't know what specific steps they can take, what, what things are out there, like all the projects you're doing, Nick, and all the training you're doing, or, and you know, all the stuff that everybody's doing. I, I think people just have a hard time maybe finding that. And, and knowing what actions to take. So that's that's the whole point of the Climate Economy Action Network. And so if anybody would like to work with me on that to try to get some things set up um, where we're actually getting people to do stuff, I'd be happy to do that. Some pilot projects, <laughs> we could call them, if you want. And um, what we want to do is get people, you know, doing actions that are going to reduce emissions. They could be things that we can verify, you know, if they're coming in to, to get a, an educational course from from or you know that's that's gonna I don't know we, we can put some sort of a value on that where they're getting points on the system and then they can they can trade those points for for other things that they need and things like that so um, it could just be an interesting way to get some things going and just to get people used to taking these actions and getting maybe some immediate rewards you know just to get them rolling and, and get used to, to doing it so um, if anybody wants to talk to me more about that just let me know there's um, one thing that we're trying to move forward with the Sustainability Commission. Um, we are going to get some data, Sean Henry told me, uh, for Public Works for some of the, the baseline data on water use, energy use, uh, their car fleet, and that kind of thing, uh, so that we can set goals for the Sustainability Action Plan of the city. Um, but there's also um, resilience toolkits to do studies of resilience across your city. And I just saw one on climate trends that, that uh, Columbia, Missouri has done. They have a sustainability officer that's on the staff there and also doing a resilience plan. And part of why that's trickier to do and it takes more involvement of different folks is that it, it's not something where you look at a baseline of usage or anything. It has to do with studying this wheel of interlocking um, characteristics of different neighborhoods that de help determine how resilient they are. You know, talking, Nick's talking about the lack of food and lack of income, lack of, you know, money to pay rent um, and all sorts of things. And then the wellness ways in which um, illness and different, certainly COVID-19 hitting inequitably to all of us. So there's part of what we might d discuss at some point is ways in which this uh, a climate action network uh, could work together to try to figure out how to do the study. I know there there's tools out there. If you if you look up resilience, um, uh, I forget what the um, community resilience kits toolkits. Um, there are such things, but I think they cost money <laughs> to you know to engage in, um, and it it's not great for COVID nineteen because it takes meetings would be the most, you know, in-person meetings would be the most, uh, um, it'd be the easiest way to do it anyway. So I'm just bringing that up as something that occurs to me that this, the tool that you've created, Amy, and that we're doing through this kind of a, a meeting could, could help with brainstorming on how to, to, to accomplish the, the assessment, the resilience assessment of different areas. Uh, so yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I think um, I, something I forgot about from our, our first meeting on Earth Day, we did a climate swap for Carbondale, and I haven't <laughs> put those oh, right, there yet right, right. and sent that out yet. So that would be a good starting point because the whole idea is to work off the basis of local communities, local community right. strengths, weaknesses, right. opportunities, and threats. So right. Um, right. I, I yeah. yeah, okay. Definitely related, indeed. Okay, well, um, I don't think we had anything else on the agenda. So does anybody have, Bo, you've been awfully quiet. You wanna pipe in and say anything here today? Bo, hello. You may I'm be just listening to the 
Oh, okay. <laughs> That's okay, I guess. Or anything else? Anne, George Anne. We'll Thank here. you so much. Nice to have this little social time. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. Oh, uh, yeah, I mean, I think, um, I think I'd like to keep this rolling if that's okay with everybody, because I think I'd like to use it as an opportunity for people to, to talk about what's happening, but also what they need. Um, we kind of keep this discussion going so we can all know what the other person is doing, what the other groups are doing, and um, so that whenever we can overlap, we can we can do that. And um, does this day and time work pretty well for everybody? Like fourth Wednesday, four o'clock, or should I try for something else? It's fine by me. Seems to work for me. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I think I've already got the meetings well. set up as recurring, so um, I was planning on doing that. And I'll talk about the climate SWAT next time. I'll already have that. Um, okay. Well, that's a good idea to get to think about using yeah our community data to do something like that. So right, right, and I could maybe share some of the material that I found. Some of it's on that I found is on Second Nature, the university um, uh, sort of structure that's online for universities to get accreditation or get credits for being credentialed for being uh, resilient and sustainable. I'll do that. Yep. Okay, great. And if anybody else, um, just keep sending me stuff. If you want me to post it on love for earth, love for dot earth, um, I can do that. And uh, the Facebook page and everything. And anything else? Anyone? Going once? If anybody, if anybody wants a smiley face or a smiley sun mask, Lady in My Rotary Club's made me 30 so far. Ooh, I can uh -huh. mail it to you. Yeah, I need a mask. So. <laughs> All right, I'll mail you one. Thanks. She puts she puts a uh, what do you call it um, pipe cleaner metal here. Oh, nice. So. Oh, that's a good idea. Yeah, so I got one made really well. I got one made for me by Andrea LeBeau. Do you know who she is? Our oh yeah, artist. classy. I have a beautiful black. <laughs> mask. Yeah, I have bad lungs, so like I don't go out and about, but. She gave me these masks and they work really well. So, all cool. right, I'm going to go buy some food at the market here. Yeah. Okay. Before, Thank you, everybody, and have a great next month. And we'll talk again in June. Thank great. you. Yeah. Thanks again. Stay energized. Oh, see you summer solstice. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> okay.